Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the latest in our series of Professional Advisors Working Lunches. Today, we're pleased to welcome some new faces from Lead Generation Specialists Performance Leads. I'm Hope William Smith, Editor of Professional Advisor, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Before we get going with today's session, let me quickly run you through the usual housekeeping. Your microphones and cameras are currently switched off and we'd be most grateful if you could keep them that way, just to ensure that there's no background noise and so our speakers can be heard nice and clearly. I should also inform you that this session is being recorded and we will send you a link of the recording by tomorrow. And do feel free to share this with your colleagues. As usual, today's working lunch will qualify for one hour of CPD and we'll be sending you proof of attendance along with the link to the recording of the session and that will arrive in your inboxes tomorrow. Now, I've sat next to many advisors at events who have told me that they don't need any more new clients. They are busy enough already. The fact is though, no matter where you are in the business cycle, whether it's growing your business or seeking to maximize its value for an exit, new clients are an essential element for growth as well as the valuation of your business. I'm delighted to be joined today by two key executives from Performance Leads, a leader in the field of business acceleration. Co-founder Ed Wilkinson and head of partnerships PTX will discuss the powerful impact of online lead generation as an accelerant for business growth. Ed and Pete will also talk through the key metrics, best practice and other essentials for success. Do feel free to put any and all of your questions to our guests using the chat function, which you will find in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. If you wish to remain, uh, remain anonymous asking your question, then simply select my name from the drop-down list in the chat box before you type your message so only I can see it. So just before I hand over to Ed and Pete, let me quickly run you through our learning objectives for today's session. So at the end of today's presentation, you should know how your business will benefit from using an online lead generation service. You should know how to measure and judge the success of an investment in online lead generation. And you should also know how to choose a lead generator to work with and from an advice perspective and an overview of best practice to ensure that you have the best chance of success with online lead generation. So that is the CPD covered. Let's hear from Ed Wilkinson from Performance Leads. Good afternoon, Ed. Good afternoon, Hope. How are you? Well, thank you. Good. Right. Let me just share my screen. Hopefully everybody can see that. So thanks, Hope. First of all, can we... Um, Thank everybody for taking the time to uh, join us this lunchtime uh, as we discuss the benefits of online lead generation uh, as a way of growing your business, at whatever stage of career you're at. Um, I think we're going to start with a poll uh, that Hope's going to hopefully put on the screen for us now. So while the poll runs, I'll just give you a little bit of background on um, our experience in this space. Um, I've owned digital marketing companies um, for 20 years. Uh, I've worked in the financial services digital marketing space for, for nearly 10 years um, and including um, seven years uh, at performance leads since I started it back in 2017. Uh, Pete's got over 30 years um, leadership experience within business development and account management uh, and has been with us at performance leads since um, almost day one. Okay. So just looking at the results of the initial poll, that's interesting. I mean, it, it, it probably bears out what we see ourselves um, in the advisors who typically uh, speak to us and, and join our um, join us. Um, there's, a, there's a significant amount of businesses um, in the middle of their journeys um, and quite a few towards the end um, with less at the very beginning, mostly with issues over uh, of cash flow um, and, and experience. Um, Okay. Hang on. Move. There we go. 
Right. So I thought it'd be useful uh, to briefly cover the different types of online lead gen uh, before focusing on the one that dominates the uh, third party lead gen space. So display uh, and social media, if we begin with those, um, they're in essence the same things, uh, but they appear in different places. Um, display leads are generated uh, by consumers uh, clicking on adverts or advertorials, which appear at the, uh, the side, the bottom, or sometimes within the page of websites that consumers visit. Uh, social media leads work in the same way as display, um, but the ads appear within the feed, which shows posts from people you follow on things like Facebook and Instagram. Uh, both display and social media can generate uh, large amounts of um, leads, good volume, uh, often at very attractive prices. Um, the major downside to these leads is lack of intent. Um, they're, they're the sort of equivalent of sweets um, at the till of your local co-op uh, when you've gone into purchase something completely different, a pint of milk. You know, this lack of intent typically means a much lower conversion uh, to fact find, and that, increased both, that increases both the cost of opportunity uh, and adds in additional employee costs due to the number of extra call attempts needed to uh, generate um, an opportunity. Organic leads, otherwise known as SEO leads, are they a great source of consumer inquiries and they often have a really high level of intent. Um, the downside is that they are very difficult to predict um, when leads will be available, um, when they may stop and what volume will be produced. Using another analogy, um, it's a bit like um, digging for oil. There's a really high level of uh, investment required up front. In the case of, of this, it's um, generating content and um, purchasing um, links. Um, and when you do strike oil, if you do start, you, know, you, you don't know, it's impossible to stop that flow. You don't know, um, or certainly not impossible to stop the flow quickly, and you can't target it towards a particular type of lead or a particular area of the country. It's, uh, it's, it's very much an all or nothing type approach. It's very good to have as part of your mix, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend anybody relying on it as their only source of, um, of inquiries. Um, so that leads on to uh, PPC, uh, other one, otherwise known as pay-per-click, um, as a lead source. Typically, inquiries from this source who have a higher intent, um, and they're from customers who are actively searching the web um, for financial advice, obviously, in, in, in these examples. Um, further caveat here is that what we're doing today is sharing our experiences of generating pay-per-click leads. Um, and sharing our partner's experience of buying pay-per-click leads from us. Uh, we're not going to comment on the source, volume, or quality of uh, leads generated by any of our competitors. Right, now I think Hope is going to run the second poll for us. Please, Hope. Okay. While that runs, um, maybe it's worth just, again, a bit more in terms of our experience. To give you a bit of our background in terms of compliance, um, we're one of only four partners approved to supply leads to SJP partners. Uh, we've been um, assessed and signed off by tenant at head office level, uh, and we're an affinity partner for Quilter. Um, it's worth asking that of any partner you work with. You know, compliance is 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 a is a obviously a touchstone, a key word for things uh, in the space currently. And hopefully, we're keen. Seem to get a response. Okay, that's a large number of uh, of participants who've tried lead generation before, and have had a bad, bad experience. There you go. I really, really like to deep dive with people and try and see why they've had a bad experience because there can always be a a number of different reasons why that's possibly happened. That's interesting, and it, it, it's good to know that you know. Hopefully, some of the things we'll share today. Um, might convince some of you to um, to give lead generation, lead generation another try, or certainly to be better prepared for, for trying it with ourselves or with any other partner uh, partner out there. And at least be open to a conversation at some point. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to focus on the benefits of using uh, pay-per-click lead generation um, as a process of identifying and attracting a significant volume of potential clients who are interested in receiving financial advice. 
Pay-per-click lead gen is 100% based on data-driven insights. So that means that a combination of keywords, ads, uh, geography, demographics, devices, and bids enables repeatable and most critically controllable volumes of leads and a consistency of acquisition cost that allows us to fix a price and volume with confidence. This control um, unlocks scalability over almost any time frame. So from as little as five leads per month uh, per postcode to a thousand leads a month across the whole of the UK. Um, and this also control also allows for adjustments in volume up or down uh, in a very tailored uh, focused way, which means that we can react to our partners, uh, business needs, and or budgets. It's also very cost effective. Now, again, I'd, I'd caveat that a little bit with um, it's unlikely that any form of paid lead generation can compete on a cost per inquiry basis with referrals, but referrals are severely limited by uh, predictability and volume. Uh, PPC leads are the most cost-effective type of online lead generation when you need a specific volume within a specific time frame to enable you to achieve a specific goal. Um, they are particularly cost-effective within lead, online lead generation because they enable partners to target by advice type, pension and retirement, for example, I meaning you don't receive inquiries from people searching for debt or mortgage help, um, and they can also target by postcode, so you don't receive leads um, or you don't waste budget on inquiries from locations um, that you can't help or don't want to service for any particular reason. Uh, we also find quite a lot of our partners um, find PPC leads a really cost-effective way of trading new advisors um, without having to risk burning potentially high value or high converting referrals, which I've already mentioned are, are, are a bit like gold dust and the few and far between in this scheme of or the scale of what we're talking about today. So the final attribute of um, pay-per-click lead gen is that it's relatively low risk. Um, it's a proven model measured by lead by lead MI from partners across the UK over tens of thousands of leads um, that performance leads have, 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 have delivered. It enables us to say with confidence that if you spend X amount of money, it will generate X amount of leads. And if you follow these X number of best practice steps that Pete will talk us through shortly, you will when measured over a X amount of time generate a specific level of return on your investment. So the combined effect of buying leads, which are predictable, scalable, adjustable, cost-effective, and low risk, is that it gives partners confidence to properly plan for a fixed outcome. Whether, whether you're talking about recruiting new advisors, uh, looking at opening an office in a new location, <laughs> If you're a new advisor looking to um, build funds and management from a standing start, um, or you're somebody in the middle of your journey where you're just looking to replace churn, you know, partners, uh, customers who've moved on to, to somebody else or who have died, and you want to just ensure that your, 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 your trail level keeps the same amount. Or we often find other partners who are, who are looking to exit in a short period of time and want to be able to grow their business quite aggressively. This is a great way of building uh, funds and management uh, prior to an exit. Thanks so much for that, Ed. Uh, just before we move into the second section of the presentation, I'd just like to ask you to expand a little bit more, please, on the algorithms and the methods that you use to determine the benefits of using a lead generation service. Okay, so um, so the, the table is is you know, it's, it's, a, it's a visual thing that you're looking at now as, as a way of trying to illustrate the, the, the power of buying a lead, of what that can generate back in terms of year one revenue, um, a, li a lifetime value or a sustainable and sellable asset. I think, we uh, sorry, I, I think it's important to note from this particular, these tables that um, these are averages. These aren't necessarily our best performing partners. Um, these are averages that people have achieved across the across the years, uh, based on tens of thousands of leads that have been measured um, on decent numbers. Okay, thanks, Pete. So, in terms of understanding the table, there's, there's two things to think about. There's variables and there's assumptions. Um, so, the the variables are uh, price per lead, 
uh, which vary across the first three columns, um, and volume, which vary across all five columns. And then we've made some assumptions to be able to um, make this uh, a, a intelligible and table that you, you can understand across different sizes and timescales. So we've used a conversion rate of business of 10%. Uh, in reality, amongst our successful partners, this varies anywhere from 8 to 15%. Uh, we've used a, an average fund size of £80,000, which is very much on the low side. Uh, average consistently uh, over the last seven years is between one hundred and ten and £120,000. Uh, we've assumed a, a commission level of around 3% for initial business. Uh, so we've used £2,500 as, as, as a number. Um, an ongoing trail value of 0.75% um, and a lifetime span of around 18 years. And then uh, finally, we've assumed a funds under management resale value of uh, five times one year's trail. We know this can vary anywhere from sort of three to six times, depending on the company and the circumstances. But again, we've had to pick some numbers to, to, to be able to um, illustrate it. I hope that helps people understand the table. Happy to answer more questions on it later if, if required. Uh, and I think we're now going to run a final poll. And then I'll talk about best practice. Um, try and show people the way in which this needs to be done and the certain steps that need to be followed in order to get your best result from a lead supply. Okay. Before Peter does that, I'll quickly touch on measurement and, and how to judge success. Which about why this uh, the result of this poll will be particularly interesting. Okay. Okay, so that's interesting. So nearly half of the people who are, who are present today um, do measure um, return on marketing spend, um, but only um, one in five include a lifetime value. Um, and one in three think about um, the the, uh, the business, the lead board as generating an asset with a resale value. Okay, well, thanks for everybody for answering that. So I'm going to do one last little piece, quickly just discussing um, how to measure success and how to judge success. Um, so the number one thing that I say to any advisor considering lead generation of any form is you have to treat it as an investment. You know, any, the people who, who, who judge it as a, as, a, as a product, a lead by lead, do invariably do not make this work because they focus on the, on the wrong metrics, they focus, they focus on the wrong things. If you treat it as an investment, then what you focus on is the key metric of return on investment to, um, to measure the performance of it. So within our business, as we define ROI, we do it as profit divided by um, cost or investment uh, displayed as a percentage. It also can be calculated using revenue in place of profit, which gives you a higher number. Um, so it's, it's worth making sure that any discussions you have internally, externally with the lead partners or elsewhere, you're clear on which, which definition you're using. We always use, use profit. Um, we find it's the most accurate way of doing it. Um, when you use, um, when you measure ROI, the, the other key thing is to use a reasonable time, allow a reasonable time for maturity. Um, and when you measure it, use it as a as a use a fixed period of time to measure rather than a rolling a rolling um, a rolling spend. Because if you if you measure a rolling spend at a date at a point in time with the revenue or profit number to date, you're not getting the two numbers aren't aligned. Um, so you're only get an indicative idea of uh, success or, or otherwise. So take a fixed period of time, say January to January to March 2023, and then measure it at the end of March, at the end of June, at the end of December. As it matures, to get a to get a proper idea of uh, what the return on those on that lead spend was, um, and make sure you also include um, things like you know not only direct business that's come from those leads, but any referrals from people who've been referred from from those from those introduced via those paid leads. Um, and in terms of judging success, once you have you have your return on investment number, I guess the key thing to think about is. What we're talking about here is not just generating the odd lead, it's, it's, it's buying leads with the purpose of achieving a specific goal. You know, those things we talked about, you know, 
uh, opening an office, recruiting staff, um, topping up your funds under management, starting, you building your funds under management quickly or aggressively growing in the last couple of years before you exit a business. Is, are the leads, that the investment you've made, are they enabling you to, to, to move towards or achieve that target that you've set in place for yourself? Um, make sure you include the trail income because it's a significant amount of, um, of return in addition to the initial uh, any initial um, any, any initial commission that you earn in, in the first year, for example. And again, remember to treat it as what you're buying is an asset. You know, you've got something that either has a long life trail income or something that after the first year you can sell in the short to medium time for a return of anywhere between sort of, you know, three and six times. When we try, you know, we showed the table before, which is takes a little bit of explaining, but when we try and explain lead gen and his benefits to, to partners when we meet them in, um, at events, et cetera, we tend to use um, an, an analogy like this. You, know, you spend a pound and for every pound you spend, you'll get back between two and three pounds in the first year and an additional either eight to 12 pounds over in lifetime trailer over its time, or you can sell that um, for two to four pounds after the first year. So you're, you're, you're getting back anywhere between you know, 10 pounds or five or four pounds from um, worse performing to 15 to seven, uh, to seven pounds um, for the highest performer, performers of our, um, of our partners. Um, and, when, and when you're judging the success, just think about, it's easy to, to, to look just at just like the leads themselves, which is an important part of the mix. But think about adherence to best practice. You know, Pete's going to go through some, some, some key things that really do make the difference between success and failure. How closely have you and your team adhered to them? Um, what alternatives are there out there? You know, is it just a question of not, 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 not going after the, the target that you have in mind? Uh, or are there other alternatives which might generate the same thing but at a higher cost? Um, you know, make sure you know what your average value of customer acquisition is in the business generally and then compare that with... Um, the numbers generated by using paid search, and obviously you know, taking into account the fact that you've got consistency and reliability of both uh, volume, so that what it does give you, even if it's a slightly higher cost, it gives you that confidence and that consistency uh, to be able to properly plan um, for important steps in your in your careers and in, in, the, in the in the lifespan of your of your firms. Um, okay, I'm going to pass over to Pete now. I think. Um... One of the difficulties that advisors often come across when they're comparing different lead generators is that it's very, very difficult to compare apples with apples because so many different lead generation companies have wildly different propositions. Um, in an ideal world and budget allowing, you would run with various different propositions all at the same time in order to work out which one best suits you. Um, not always uh, possible, but that is something that we do try and encourage advisors to consider. Um, I think one of the one of the first things to consider, especially if you've never tried lead generation before, or indeed if you've tried it and you haven't enjoyed it, is to avoid lengthy onerous contracts. Um, contracts can often vary in length from anywhere from 24 hours, which is what we run, right up to three months. Um, there's various different lead generation companies out there who do particularly want to tie you in and they're particularly looking for you to pay money up front in order to tie you in. That's possibly something that you might want to um, avoid. Just on that, I mean, I think it's really important to think about, again, this idea that what you're making is an investment as opposed to buying a product means that it, you're much more likely to think about it and you want your partner to think about it as a partnership. You know, it's not... It's not, it's not, you, you guarantee that you're going to pay us, you're, you're signing for 90 days or three months, and you're going to buy these leads, regardless of how you're doing with it, regardless of whether or not it works for you right at that moment in time. Um, it needs to be a partnership that has ebb and flow, that has two and two, has feedback from both sides mm -hmm. that enables us to be successful. You know, we're, 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 for us personally, we're not interested in working with partners for it to fail for them. We want it, we want to, uh, we want, success stories and we want people to to you know we know how well they can work with people and we want people to 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 want to work with us we don't hold anybody to any contracts it doesn't do anybody any good correct um so look for flexibility within the proposition 
Um, it's very important to have um, changes made to your own personal proposition at any time that you that you require them. Um, and the changes that you need making need making fairly quickly. Um, you might want to increase your numbers or decrease your numbers or change your postcode mix geographically. And there could be various different reasons why you might want to dip in and out. You might want a holiday stop. You might have got busy. And so you might want to switch off while you catch up. Um, but definitely looking for flexibility within the proposition is massively important. Make sure that the customer journey is transparent. I think what a lot of uh, people don't understand is that before a lead goes to an advisor, there is a whole story there which can often determine the end result of a lead supply. So try to understand how the lead has been generated, where it's come from, what messaging the enquirer has received on that particular journey. For instance, you may wish to try and avoid calculator and comparison sites because a customer online on a calculator or comparison site they're possibly not looking for a phone call with an advisor. They're possibly just looking for some figures online to begin with. If they get a message telling them that an advisor is going to give them a call, they can often feel like they're misled online. And it can be quite a difficult journey for the advisor when he's um, contacting that customer because they might feel like they've been misled online. Um, exclusivity of leads is massively important as well you really don't want to be in competition with other advisors for one particular lead so make sure that the lead is just sent out to one advisor on an exclusive basis um, they need to be real-time leads as well it's no good looking for leads that are that are that are old and um, they, they need to be new leads because customers are definitely online looking for instant gratification these days so have a reliable point of contact within the organization that you're dealing with. I think it's often important to try and have face-to-face -face contact with the representative from the lead generation company um, and you feel comfortable that that person fully understands what it is that, that we're all trying to achieve for each other. I guess that would be me within performance leads. So make sure it does what it says on the tin. Um, the, 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 the figures that Ed shared earlier, they're real figures that we've uh, gleaned from various different advisors who've been with us for a number of years. And the figures that are measured on tens of thousands of leads. Um, but it gives you something to work off. It gives you something to set your standards by and to know that when you're measuring it, it does do exactly what it says on the tin. I think referrals and recommendations, they're massive in our job, just like they're massive in your job. Um, and I think it's important to ask to speak to existing partners who have experience of the lead supply. It's no good um, a lead generation company alone telling you how wonderful everything is. You need to find out from advisors who already have the proposition to find out how they get on with it. Um, I think they can often share the pitfalls with you as well and try and explain the hurdles that you might have to overcome in order to get a good result. So how to choose a lead generator to work with and from an advisor perspective, an overview of best practice to ensure that you have the best chance of success with PPC or online lead generation. So whilst we talk about having um, avoiding lengthy onerous contracts, it's also conversely important to consider committing to the process. It's no good judging your success on a handful of leads because it's really not going to tell you what you need to know. So in order to commit to the process, we do always discuss with prospective new partners measuring us on a minimum of 30 leads. Um, advisors have such a long lead time, it can often be three months from start to finish with a lead before you see a lead come to fruition. So it's important to have that time to allow the leads to mature in order for you to measure it correctly. I think also by judging your success on a, on a number of leads, it tries to encourage advisors to not judge us on individual leads, but to judge us on an overall success. What have you spent? What have you written in business? But more importantly, what does that look like from a trail income as you move forward? 
ensure that everybody in the team who's dealing with the leads fully understands the process and buys in. So we, we do specifically train um, various different people within the organization as to how we think that the leads need to be handled. Um, you know, in, initially, your, your, your speed of response to begin with is massively important. And I think if, if um, teams are let down with a slow speed of response, there's that initial golden hour that we always talk about when you need to first speak to a lead. But if that's not happening to begin with, you're effectively failing at the first hurdle. Um, so it is massively important that everybody fully understands all the way down the line what it is that we're trying to achieve, including you know, including what those measurements of, of success are. What are you trying? You know, it's the people who haven't dealt with leads before. They can feel, look, and feel very different from customer referrals, for example. And if you know, we we could have had full buy-in from a business owner who absolutely gets it, gets ROI, understands that it's a it's a maybe a lower return of investment compared to a referral but there's 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 volume at speed to achieve a specific purpose but if that isn't filtered down to the team correctly then you can get some negativity or some some um frustrations from team members who 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 don't know what it is that they're, what they're looking for doesn't know what's good and what's bad in terms of um dealing with the, dealing with the leads they are a very different type of lead they do require you know, and, and knowing what success looks like, for example. Yeah. So knowing that a contract rate, if, if you're not achieving a contract rate of 80%, then you need to look at, at, at what you're doing with your contract strategy. You know, that's where it's useful for us having, you know, we working with people like Perfect Needle who, who are completely separate from us, but, you know, who have taken our leads, taken leads from multiple partners and always recommend they, that, um Consume of advice firms take leads if they want to if they want to help in um, in lead generation they work with us because he knows the contract rates from our leads for example much higher than anybody else has ever worked with um, but if you but knowing that there's third parties who who are confirming the contract rate that can be achieved knowing there's other partners out there who've got high contract rates gives you a benchmark to aim for that that's completely arbitrary it's not set by us it's set by the leads and if you're not achieving it then and your team aren't achieving it then um, that's going to severely impact how successful um, you are with the proposition. So ensure that you're equipped to deal with the leads effectively, make sure that you, all of your ducks are lined up. So again, initial speed of response and a decent follow-up call strategy. I think the advisors who do particularly well with this are good at recognising that certain leads need nurturing. There are certain leads who are ready to do business immediately, but there's also a number of leads who will won't necessarily be ready straight away but if you can have a dedicated follow-up call strategy and a call plan and be organized with that it can often make a difference to um your success with the lead supply um identify again identify the leads that need nurturing and be organized with a follow-up strategy and have the right attitude to set appointments uh, with as many leads as possible um Again, advisors who do well with this are, are, the, are the people who would literally go to the opening of an envelope because they understand that um, on an initial phone call, the enquirer is not necessarily going to give you the full extent of the opportunity until they're comfortable with you and your offering. It's effectively the case of people buying from people at the end of the day. Okay. Well, that's the end of um, our sort of prepared presentation. Um, Pete's available at any time to um, to talk to anybody who's interested in, in who has questions beyond what we talked through today. And obviously, we'll share a uh, we'll we'll drop people an email tomorrow. Um, but hopefully, there's some um, some questions have come out of um, the things we've talked about so far. Hope. Fantastic. Thanks both. Uh, as Ed said, that does bring us to the end of our discussion, uh, which leaves us for a good long stretch of time for some Q and A. If you'd like to ask a question to either of our panelists, please just write it in the chat box and I will ask it as soon as I'm able. Uh, I can see there's already quite a few questions in there and I have a couple Good. of my own. Um, so let me start by asking a popular question that we've had a couple of times today, which is what makes your offering really stand out against better known providers in the industry who are offering similar services, for example, unbiased? Okay. Um, so, um, 
there's, 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 there's two there's two main things um, in terms of unbiased as a specific example well, that they can't cope with the with the they can't compete with the sort of volume of leads that we that we could generate for partners um, and they have a they have a very, they have a different model in that they're, they're charging to be on the directory um, as well as then additionally paying for leads that are generated so it's not quite the same the same model they are good leads again that they, they have good intent we, we we regularly speak to advisors who say you know if they could have 10 20 leads from unbiased every month they'd be they'd be really happy but but the but they're not able to um they obviously were, were bought out relatively recently and changed their model to be much more aggressive in charging for leads um and um you know we we don't often find that we have partners who don't jo don't join us because no. they get enough leads they want from unbiased or leave us to go and buy leads for, solely from unbiased we wouldn't say don't take leads from unbiased because they're, it, it's a great it's a great product or it's a, it's a great opportunity uh, it's just not going to give you any volume is it yeah P particularly um a, a large number of our partners do use unbiased at exactly the same time which is what we try and encourage advisors to do like i said where budget allows um run different propositions concurrently alongside each other um and you'll you'll definitely work out which is which is best and which isn't but you know if you get in an roi at the end of the day and it's working for you then i wouldn't ever advise that anybody stops doing that we um going back to the table we showed earlier the the cheapest product we have on there of the product lead type is is something that we introduced last year specifically to deal with um new advisors who were who were maybe challenged over cash flow but also it's interesting the people who've joined today the, the the two thirds of advisors maybe who who who've tried leads and 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 have been dissatisfied with the with the results um and what we try, what we've done is uh, introduced a product whereby it's, just, it's it, there's less guarantee of volume. There's no guarantee of volume, but you're talking maybe five leads a month, but it's at a much lower price point, a 40% a, a um, discount on our standard lead price as a way of, it's exactly the same lead generated from exactly the same source. There's no difference, but we just don't chase, don't chase volume. And that's the beauty of paid search. You can, you can, you can increase or decrease your bids accordingly. Um, so we, we, we're able to achieve, generate a certain number of leads at a lower price, which we can then sell with a smaller margin to partners who who, who are new to it or who have had bad experiences who want to try 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 something different. You know, we, we often speak to partners who've had bad experiences with other lead generators, and that's that's put them off for life in essence. You know, they, they just don't want to commit or spend because they, they lost so much money the first time around. Um, and we're we're adv advocates for you know trying to get people back on the process. We really believe that you know it's a great way. A great way of achieving a a fixed targeted um, outcome, um, and um, you know we've got lots of success stories that if you follow, yeah, you know, it's it's not it's not not a one way street. It's you know it's it's a it's a partnership of both sides fulfilling their side of the of the bargain. We need to supply high intent, good quarter leads in volume at a fair price, uh, and advisors need to uh, ensure they're set up correctly that the team buy into it. Um, and that they uh, they don't put barriers in front of themselves that affect success. Excellent. Thank you for that. Someone has asked, can you set a minimum fund value for leads? So, so we don't particularly ask the enquirer online what their fund value is. Um, I, I, I spoke briefly about it earlier, trying to avoid calculator and comparison sites. What we know to be true, because we've tried this many times, is that the only way that you can successfully get an inquirer to tell a website how old they are and how much money they've got is to use websites that masquerade as calculator and comparison sites which consequently is a very misleading journey for the inquirer and it makes it um, a very difficult uh, initial conversation from the advisor because that customer will feel like they've been misled online. Um, we are very beholden to um, feedback from advisors to let us know what the average assets under management are or funds under management um, and, and to, to tell us what the average pot sizes are. We would, um, I mean, our main products are based around advice. So um, therefore, it's, it's more about understanding need. Um, and so we know our average values are around 120, 110 to 120,000 pounds. The way in which paid search works is you can ask as many questions as you, as you like, but in reality, the more questions you ask, 
Um, by asking the question, you affect the conversion rate, which increases the cost of, of acquiring that lead, which means that the cost of buying the lead goes up. Um, and then also you, you then have to potentially, you know, you don't ask a question unless you're interested in what the answer is, and you want to potentially filter out some of those answers. We already filter out, you know, uh, invalid numbers, clearly invalid names. Uh, we, we don't supply debt leads or, um, you know, final salary leads, unless people want them, or mortgage leads. They all go in, they're already filtered out from the main position. And these are people who are searching for financial advice. So all that happens is you, 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 you increase the, you increase the cost of generating the lead, which affects the volume and isn't isn't even really a true representation of what the value of that of that answer is. Because people, if you ask a pot size, people won't necessarily know the answer. We'll give you an answer on one pot, but actually, when you speak to them, they've got four or five pots. Mm -hmm. You don't know the value of speaking to the you know making a decision not to speak to a consumer because they said they've got a low value pot. That could be you know, a big mistake. But you speak to that that consumer, and they actually have more pots, or they have other members of the family or friends who need assistance. Um, you know, it's, it's it's a bad idea, we believe, in our experience of talking to our successful partners, it's a bad idea to put barriers in place. What we want is to bring people in who are searching for advice, who want help. Um, we filter out the people who are clearly, you know, so the people who are just looking for debt, and for example, who are very unlikely to need um, or have a, a high value opportunity. Uh, but beyond that, we, we, we trust our partners, people on our panels, uh, to speak to consumers and understand what their needs are, supply them with uh, whatever help they need, and from that, build a relationship. Excellent. Well, a good question we've got here that flows on for that is, are you able to say what the average AUM for the leads generated is? Between 110 and 120. Yeah, so it says, as mentioned before, it's it's an average of 110 to 120. Every time we measure it, we measure it every sort of six to 12 months, and it always stays around the same. Which is which is in line with average pot sizes across the UK anyway. Yeah. Um, they do vary a little bit geographically from a point of view of where the enquiries are coming from. Um, but yeah, average between 110 and 120. Excellent. Well, look, you brought up uh, geographics, which is perfect because someone here has asked easily generation better suited to firms in larger areas or cities or is it equally effective for rural advisors i think um i think what you what you have to bear in mind is that people who are searching online for an advisor are still possibly looking for local advice from a local advisor so we would always advocate initially that you try a lead supply close to home to begin with um, there's no point in an advisor being in Sheffield and having a lead from somebody in Birmingham because it's not really what the inquirer is looking for. Um, so we are very, very particular on geography. Um, we might look at somebody in Sheffield, for instance, and advise that, that they spread out a little bit, just dependent on the kind of volume that they're looking for. Um, in terms of the comment about uh, city versus versus rural, it's, it's an interesting one because, yeah, you can potentially have higher values in cities, but at the same time, you can have a lot of, a lot of lower value or, or, or consumers with, 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 with less value or with higher intent and with less value because of the mixture of, of people who live together. You know, you could be in London and within a couple of streets, you have, you know, you have 10 million pound houses and the next one you have council flats. Um, and similarly, in the, you know, the, the challenge in the rural areas is you, you might have a higher value of um of property or higher value of, of income or pension pot, but there might be more widely spread out, so there's less of them available. Um, we, we, you know, we have partners who do both approaches. We don't tend to find partners who, who deliberately include or exclude an area. It tends to work best, like most things, if you take a take a spread, and you try you try and um, you try and cover an area that has a mixture mixture of everything. Fantastic. Well, look, questions coming in thick and fast here. Someone has asked, how does the use of a lead generator compare to creating your own marketing through videos and social media? Okay. So there's, um, again, we, we, ad we advocate uh, all um, partners or all uh, advisors to have their own websites and look to generate their own traffic and do various other things. You know, it's not it's not an either or. Um, what we would say is that uh, paid search is a is a fantastic tool. 
uh, it's a very easy way of spending lots of money with, with, with not an awful lot of outcome. Yeah. Uh, we're experts, you know, I've worked in paid search for 20 years. Uh, we've worked within paid search within financial services for 10 years and performance leads. You know, we're generating uh, tens of thousands of leads a, a year. Um, and that does two things. It buys your experience. Um, and, you know, we've made the mistakes uh, and spend the money and been burned so that our partners don't need to. If you, if you do, you know, um, and Google also reflect the size of your business, reflect the size of how much you spend and where you appear in the bidding and how much you'll pay per click and how much you'll pay per lead is impacted by the size of your, your spend with, with, with Google. Um, and um, is there something else, please, have in mind? Um, I, I think also, you have to bear in mind the amount of leads that we that we strip out. Um, you'd be amazed at the amount of people That's who yeah. who think that a financial advisor wants to help them with their debt situation. Um, you know, we, we'll generate hundreds and hundreds of debt inquiries every year that there's not a financial advisor in the UK who wants those leads. But if you are running your own campaigns, then obviously you do run the risk of generating leads that you won't particularly want. Um, that's just part and parcel of what we do every day of the week. Thanks for that, Pete. A similar question here that again sort of leads on quite nicely. Someone has said, should I be focused on investing in updating my website and making it fit for purpose before I consider lead generation? Do they go hand in hand? I think um, an inquirer online who leaves an inquiry on one of our sites, for instance, and gets a message telling them that this particular advisor is going to give them a call, I think the inquirer will possibly want to have a look at that advisor online before they take the call so we do always say that it is important to have a good online presence you know these are online leads that we're generating at the end of the day and so an online presence is important because that's where the leaders come from and I, and I think that most inquirers will want to look at that advisor online before they take the call or at least after they've taken a call at some point but it doesn't I mean things have moved on quickly it's not expensive now to, 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 no. to have a simple brochure site that explains um, what you do and um, you know has some trust signals on there. Yeah. If it's a different sense, if you're talking about having your own site to attract leads, to attract consumers, um, well, it's a bit like you know I can't think of a good example, but in essence, there's no point having a great site if nobody knows your site's there. You know, you, you have to a site on its own does nothing; it needs traffic. Yeah. So you choose where to get that traffic from. You either pay for yourself, um, which can be expensive. You try and generate organic traffic, which, as I mentioned earlier, is very hit and miss and is very expensive um, and, and has a long lead time. Um, or you you um, you know you buy traffic from somewhere else. Um, all of those things come with a cost. And again, it's not an either or. But I, I um, if you choose to try and do paid search yourself, you either do it yourself, which take which means that you're spending some of your time, which could be spent elsewhere doing this, or you're paying somebody else to do it, which has its own sun cost. Um, there, there, is, there is no easy answers to this. Um, it really depends on what you're looking, what you're looking to to achieve. You know, we went through some examples earlier. The beauty of buying a fixed amount of leads is that you know it, it, it's a it's a it's a controlled cost. It's a controlled investment. You can stop at any time. Once you achieve a particular goal you've got, you can choose, or you would have capacity. You can choose to stop uh, if you're committed to doing uh, or spending money on. Um, SEO buying buying links generating content that cost is there you've had it you know and it might be a year before you see any any benefit from it. Great. Well, we've got a couple of questions here that are asking about how niche things can be. So, firstly, someone has said, "Is lead generation going to be a good investment if I'm looking to diversify my client base? For example, attracting younger clients." Uh, again, it's it's the same scenario with the asking of the pot sizes. We, we, we don't ask the inquirer how old they are at their point of application. Um, I, would, I, 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 I should say, the, yeah, the, obviously what the question is, it, I would say it wouldn't. 
specifically it wouldn't not because we don't Easy have to, not because we ask but because we do the opposite because our, our advisors are you know the vast majority of things we're talking about here are people coming towards retirement age yeah. and choosing to how to crystallize uh, their pension pot um whether it be an annuity or a drawdown, whether to 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 invest it, you know, it's large. It's those sort of decisions that come to people uh, later in life, more often than not. It's not a cheap. It's not. It's not going to be a cheap way of bringing people on who just want to start a pension in the twenty, for example. It's not. No. It's not. We 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 actively exclude using Google's tools and Bing's tools. We actively exclude people who are under the age of anywhere from forty five to fifty five because there's there's a few of them who who have have the sort of the, the value and the need. They might have the need right now, but they don't have the value which justifies the spend from an advisor's point of view. And we're keen on ensuring that uh, our advisors see see not only a, a, a short-term profit, but have that longer-term massive value in the, from the, uh, the investment they make with us. So we're actively not trying to generate leads from those people because it would take such a long time for the return on investment to show. Yep. Excellent, thank you for that. And the second question that's come in uh, here has asked, is there any way of being able to, I suppose, niche the leads into specific areas of advisor expertise? So, so we um, say the vast majority of inquiries um, are around pension and retirement, just because that's when people tend to, well, certainly the ones with value, people tend to start thinking about these things. Uh, we do generate, you know, we, we have people within, options on some of our websites, um, a more general financial advice website, so people can ask, um, it's can say that we ask people an advice type they're interested in, in and it can be uh, inheritance tax, it could be um, investments, um, it could be- uh, Financial but, planning, yeah, wealth yeah, management. But, but, they, but they tend to be, but those first two in particular, um, are something that isn't, isn't sort of pension related, um, tend to be a relatively small, amount of the mix um so yes you, you you can we don't tend to sell those types of leads on their own because that means that what you're doing is watering down the mix for everybody else and we're keen on ensuring that the quality of the mix stays the same for everybody um but yes the, there is ways of doing it it probably isn't a, a, it's probably a, way of doing it it's probably a separate conversation yeah. um that you know we'd be very interested in exploring with people we, um, we, we, we do do we, we have yeah, we do do um individual uh, agreements with 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 partners where, where we, we go and target a particular products um uh, uh, financial uh, products um and they're done usually on a sort of shared risk um investigative nature where we'll do a trial across three to six months and we'll try and generate leads at a fixed price um in return for um either a share of commission or, and or the partner uh who is the the cost? We almost act like, like an agency in those instances. It's a good way of testing out a new area. It's not a big part of our business, but if we're in terms of a, trying to um, trying to offer a true partnership, we, we do we, we, that is available in some instances. We've got a couple of things running at the moment. Yeah. Great. Well, look, let's have a slightly broader question here, but one that is no doubt just as complex in its own way. Uh, Someone said, how can we be sure the ROI will remain high using this sort of service, given unreliability of the economy, cost of living, change of need in the advice space, et cetera? It's a very, very good question, um, because the value and the intent and the need from customers does waver from time to time. Um, advisors can have particularly good months and then they might have a particularly poor month. Again, this is about how it's measured um, and measuring it over not just a decent number of leads, but also over a decent length of time in order to make allowances for the fluctuations of value and, and intent and need from, from the leads. Um, yeah, I, I, think, I think the key is, again, I focus on ROI. It depends on what the ROI number, number is you're looking for. If you, if you take into account the full lifetime value or the asset value, um, then even if th th there's periods of time when there's unrest, Ukraine, for example, or um, COVID, which are a bigger extreme, um, there's still people still need help. People will still be asking for help. People still have to make decisions. People can't can't avoid the passing of time, the passing of coming towards retirement age, having to make a decision. 
Um, and certainly over a long period of time, you know, just like over over three months, you 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 iron out the the, the the ups and downs over any period of time, you have the same thing. You know, you will you can find ways of judging something over a short period of time and it looks negative or positive, but equally you judge it over a longer period of time, mm. it, those things tend to flatten out. Mm. And I, I think from a flexibility point of view, it's important for advisors to understand that with certain lead generators you can switch your lead supply on and off at the drop of a hat. Um, and if you feel like things are getting particularly difficult out there, then you can pause your lead supply. Well, so the other thing I would say is we've never been busier. We've, we've never had more, you know, we've got more, so generating more leads now, we've got more piles on now than we've ever had. And it's, we've, we've come out with the toughest times um, in living memory and there's still lots of uncertainty going on with uh, what's happening in um in Ukraine and obviously fluctuations in the US, et cetera. Um, yet we're still busy. Consumers are still looking for help. Yeah. And they still, when we measure them, they still have an average pot size of 110 to 120,000 pounds. And advisors still want leads. And we've still got the same. We've still got a core part, partners who've been with us, who've made it work from day one and have been with us from day one. And people who've joined, who've joined, who followed the steps, bought into the process, committed, treated but, it as an investment, and, and they make it work and they stick. And we have some who are so successful, they stop. But they'll come back, but they just they're just limited by by resources, um, and they don't want to take on too many too many new, new customers and not be able to serve them correctly. So we, we do sometimes we say are sometimes a victim of our own success, uh, but that's that's a it's a frustrating position to be in, but it's a good position to be in. Yeah, it's a nice problem to have. It certainly is. And look, on that note, unfortunately. We are out of time now. So let me thank you, Ed and Pete. Uh, that was a really fascinating presentation. And thank you as well for your insights in our Q&A session. If your question was not answered in the time available, don't worry, we will send that to the team at Performance Leads and they will be able to respond to you personally. Now, before we wrap up, let's just take a quick look again at the learning objectives, which are going to be up now on the screen in front of you. Okay, now a reminder again, just quickly, that uh, if your question didn't get answered, it will be done so after the event. And again, that your CPD will be delivered tomorrow. So do please keep an eye out. Now, before I sign off, uh, just a quick reminder of some dates for your diary over what is going to be a very, very busy next couple of months for Professional Advisor. On the 25th of April, we will be celebrating the very best in our industry when we host the annual Professional Advisor Awards at London's Hilton Bankside Hotel. If you care to come along and rub shoulders with our winners, there are still one or two tables remaining. The following day, Wednesday the 26th of April, we'll be running our flagship conference, PA360, at the Brewery in London. This year's program covers everything from consumer duty to tax, from regulation to technology, and our 40 plus speakers will cover every subject that affects running an advisor business as well. PA360 is now the largest annual management conference for financial advisors in the UK. And if you'd like to catch up with Ed and Pete in person, I'm sure that they would love to see you there. Now on the 3rd of May, we continue with our Digital Working Lunch series when we'll be joined by Scottish Mortgage Investment Specialist, Claire Shaw from Bailey Gifford. And given recent events at Scottish Mortgage, I'm sure that Claire's Q&A will be a busy one. Now, if you're in Worcester on the 3rd of May, you may prefer to come and see us live at one of the first of our three regional working lunches we'll be running with Albemarle Street Partners and NSNI. Albemarle's Charlie Parker will be talking about the rational case of optimism and NSNI's Andrew Pike will be explaining that there is a lot more to NSNI than just premium bonds. You can also see Charlie and Andrew in Sheffield on the 4th of May and in Exeter on the 10th. Now, the 17th and 18th of May sees the launch of our inaugural PA management retreat at the magnificent Wharton House near Dorking in Surrey. Over two days, there's a wonderful opportunity for advisor business owners to network with peers, as well as listen to and meet with some of the industry's most influential figures. We'll have presentations from Technical Connections, Tony Wickenden, CEO of the PFS, uh, former CEO of the PFS, Keith Richards, 
uh, Chair of CEPL, Hugo Thorman, and Unique Financial Planning's Philip Martin, uh, who will discuss the pros and cons of white labeled platform solutions for advisors. There will also be a series of boardroom sessions delivered by, amongst others, Albemarle Street Partners, Bailey Gifford, Benchmark, and Orbis. Then finally, rounding off May's events are two regional working lunches. On the 24th of May, we'll be back at Dunstan Hall in Norwich, this time with Benchmark and Goldman Sachs. And the following day, we'll be at the Corinthian Club in Glasgow with Goldman Sachs and Orbis. So all in all, that is a total 13 hours of CPD for you. And you can find the details of and register for all of these events at professionaladvisor.com forward slash events. So that's it for today. All that reminds me is to thank our speakers, Ed and Pete from Performance Leads once again for their session. And of course, my biggest thanks to you, our readers, for your company this lunchtime. I trust you found this session helpful and worthwhile. And if you did, we look forward to seeing you at another PA event very soon. Goodbye.